Hey everyone, welcome back to our channel. I'm Semi Sherpa, and today, we're diving deep into the fascinating world of semiconductor tech, focusing on extreme ultraviolet lithography, EUVL. Recall our chat about multiple patterning technology, MPT? We touched on how EUVL stepped in for the 7 nanometers tech in 2019, addressing those complex process and yield issues. Well, it's time to delve deeper into EUVL. Now, if you're thinking, I'm familiar with optical lithography with deep UV light source like ARF or KRF, here's a twist. EUV isn't your typical UV, it's more in the X-ray realm. Specifically, it's a soft X-ray projection lithography, SXPL, that uses a soft X-ray light source, reflective mirrors, and a photo mask. If that sounds familiar, you're on track. If not, stay tuned, you're about to learn a lot. EUVL has a rich 30-year history, starting in 1985, and is dubbed the Next Generation Lithography, NGL. It stands distinct from traditional optical lithography. Today, we'll delve deep into its evolutionary journey from the beginning of EUVL to ASML's high-volume manufacturing tool. EUV lithography series will be treated as its own dedicated discussion, separate from the traditional photolithography series, due to the depth and complexity of the topic. It's simply too vast to cover in just one session. So, are you all set to embark on this enlightening EUVL journey? Ready to dive in? Let's roll. For over three decades, EUV lithography, EUVL, has stood as a beacon of progress in the semiconductor world, illuminating the path forward when the industry faced seemingly insurmountable challenges. From its foundational steps in 1985 to the groundbreaking 7 nanometers node production in 2019, the journey of EUVL has been marked by relentless innovation, overcoming hurdles, and achieving monumental milestones. At a time when the industry was on the brink, with many predicting the end of Moore's law, EUVL emerged as the savior, pushing the boundaries of what was deemed possible. While giants like Canon and Nikon grappled with the challenges and faced decline, EUV technology soared, with companies like ASML reaping the benefits. The advent of EUVL not only revitalized the semiconductor industry but also redefined the trajectory of technological advancement. Join us as we explore the transformative impact of EUV lithography. This is our 19th video, so please give us some encouragement and support. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and turn on notifications. Yip yip. Arf arf. In 1982, while many were focused on the new G-line of mercury for optical lithography, the idea of X-ray reduction imaging was largely overlooked. The dominant technology then was X-ray proximity lithography, XBL, aiming for a 0.5 micron resolution, a tough feat for the optical projection tools of the day. Major players like IBM in the US and NTT in Japan were deeply into XBL, even trialing it for semiconductor production. While XBL tools and resists were promising, the proximity mask posed significant manufacturing challenges. Around 1983, Hiroki Nishida, a dedicated researcher from the NTT Research Group, embarked on an in-depth study of soft X-ray proximity lithography, commonly referred to as XBL. Kinoshita had already made significant strides by developing equipment for the step-and-repeat type of proximity X-ray lithography. His focus was not just on the creation of these tools but also on their practical application, particularly in the trial production of semiconductor devices using it. As he delved deeper into these trials, he also concentrated on refining evaluation procedures. From his assessments, he found that while the exposure machine and resist performance were up to the mark, there were persistent challenges. One of the primary issues was the manufacture of membrane masks, especially due to the one-by-one -one exposure process. By 1984, these challenges prompted Kinoshita to rethink his approach. He began to see the potential of X-ray reduction lithography, which utilized a reduction mask, as a more feasible alternative to XBL. This shift in focus was driven by his motivation to overcome the challenges he faced with XBL. Now, it's essential to understand the context of this period. The prevailing belief was that standard X-rays couldn't be reflected. However, in 1981, a significant breakthrough occurred. 
Underwood and his team managed to refract an image of a grid pattern using carbon target X-rays onto a concave mirror, which was coated with a tungsten carbon multilayer. Despite this advancement, only a handful of researchers were exploring X-ray reduction lithography, even though reflective optics for this method had already been proposed. Kinoshita, with his forward-thinking approach, saw an opportunity. With the support of the Superconducting Thin Films group at his institute, he was able to fabricate a multilayer mirror coated with tungsten and carbon. Building on this, he developed the Schwarzschild optics, which were coated with a tungsten carbon multilayer on a silicon carbide base. This was specifically designed for a wavelength of 11 nanometers in X ray reduction lithography. For the mask, he opted for a transparent silicon stencil. To cater to a large exposure area, he employed a system with a ring field. This design minimized axial height aberration and required both the mask and wafer stages to move synchronously. He conducted exposure experiments at the Photon Factory in Tsukuba. However, the initial stages of this endeavor were fraught with challenges. The rudimentary visible microscope use led to significant alignment issues, causing the patterns to be severely distorted. But Kinoshita was persistent in his efforts. By 1985, after consistent hard work and adjustments, he achieved the distinct pattern you see here. Notably, using a wire mesh transparent mask, he made this pattern scale to one-fifth of a 4 micron. This achievement marked the first clear demonstration of reduction projection with soft X-ray. In the autumn of 1986, Kinoshita showcased his results at the annual meeting of the Japanese Society of Applied Optics. While the concept of using X-ray for imaging wasn't new, what Kinoshita proposed was groundbreaking, using X-ray for projection lithography. However, the reception was unexpectedly skeptical. Many attendees found it hard to fathom that projection lithography could be achieved with X-ray. To some, it sounded like a big fish story, a tale too grand to be true. Despite the skepticism, Kinoshita remained steadfast in his beliefs. He emphasized that, theoretically, an image could be produced using a reduction optical system. This would involve a set of mirrors coated with a multilayer film. If a highly reflective multilayer could be obtained, then the patterns could be exposed using X-ray reduction optics. To provide some context, this achievement is recognized as the first demonstration of extreme ultraviolet projection lithography, EUVL. It's worth noting that during that period, the term EUV, specifically wavelengths between 4 to 40 nanometers, was referred to as soft X-ray. In 1985, a groundbreaking discovery was made by Troy Barbie Jr. and his team. They developed a molybdenum silicon, MOSI, multilayer that achieved a reflectivity of over 70% at around 17 nanometers. This was a monumental achievement, marking the first instance where reflectivity approached the theoretical value. Following this development, MOSI multilayer films were specifically applied to optics. Their unique properties made them particularly suitable for the wavelength associated with the silicon absorption edge. With the advancements in MOSI multilayers, Kinoshita and his team saw an opportunity. They constructed Schwarzschild optics and a reflecting mask using these multilayers, targeting a wavelength of 13 nanometers. Eager to test the potential of their new setup, they embarked on another exposure experiment. By 1989, Kinoshita was ready to share their findings with the world. At the 33rd International EIPB Symposium in Monterey, California, he presented a 0.5 micron reduction pattern, suggesting the use of an exposure wavelength of 13.5 nanometers and incorporating two aspherical telecentric lenses into the design. His team from NTT took center stage with their paper, Soft X-ray Reduction Lithography. This was a testament to their hard work and innovation. They demonstrated the replication of a 0.5 micron pattern using the Schwarzschild imaging system and a reflective mask, achieving the ambitious resolution goals they had set. During the banquet at the conference, an intriguing interaction took place. Dr. Tanya Jewell, a Russian scientist representing AT&T, approached Kinoshita with a series of pressing questions about his presentation. However, the conversation faced a hurdle. The blend of Tanya's Russian-accented English and Kinoshita's Japanese-accented English made understanding each other quite challenging. Recognizing the difficulty, Obert Wood, also from AT&T, stepped in to bridge the communication gap. 
Acting as an impromptu interpreter, he facilitated the conversation between the two passionate scientists. With his help, what could have been a brief exchange turned into an in-depth discussion that lasted nearly two hours. Kinoshita later remarked that the discussion continued until the end of the banquet, and he didn't even have an opportunity to eat. This conversation was more than just a meeting of minds. By the next year, AT&T reported achieving a nearly diffraction-limited 50 nanometers pattern with soft X-ray projection lithography, SXBL. Undulator radiation at 14 nanometers from a synchrotron storage ring and a two-mirror Schwarzschild objective were used to print features as small as 50 nanometers lines and spaces in photoresist at a reduction of 20 to 1 from a transmission mask. Both Kinoshita and Wood later referred to that evening in Monterey as the dawn of EUVL. For your information, the technology note in 1990 that utilized 365 nanometers I-line lithography was around 800 nanometers. Yet, there was a twist. In the year 1990, remarkable results were showcased, but hold on, it was the synchrotron driving them, and it wasn't quite ready for broad industry application. But this was just the beginning. The lithography realm was on the verge of a monumental transformation. In the wake of the groundbreaking discovery using a synchrotron, the question on everyone's mind was, could there be a more compact light source for lithography? The answer came sooner than expected. Just a year later, in 1991, during the Optical Society of America, OSA, topical meeting on soft X-ray projection lithography in Monterey, California, a team from Sandia National Laboratories and AT&T introduced a game-changer, the first SXBL system powered by a laser plasma source. This system used a KRF excimer laser, which when focused on a gold-coated cylinder, showcased a notable conversion efficiency. The results were remarkable, they could produce images from a transmission mask onto thin films, and micrographs revealed they had achieved sharp resolutions of 0.1 micrometers features. This was more than just another technical achievement. It signaled a promising direction towards creating compact, industry-ready light sources for lithography, addressing one of the biggest challenges the field faced. The technology we now recognize as EUVL was initially termed Soft X-ray Projection Lithography or SXBL. But as it evolved, a challenge emerged. There was another technology in development named Proximity X-ray Lithography or PXL. The terms proximity and projection were strikingly similar, creating a potential for confusion within the industry. DARPA, a major stakeholder in the field, recognized this ambiguity. They expressed concerns about the term X-ray in the name, suggesting its removal. This feedback was pivotal. Nat Seglio, a visionary from Livermore Labs, offered a solution. He was aware of the field of astronomy's extreme ultraviolet or EUV discipline. Drawing from this, he proposed renaming SXBL to Extreme Ultraviolet Lithography or EUVL. This name not only distinguished the technology from PXL but also resonated with established scientific terminologies. But the transition wasn't just about adopting a new name. A significant moment occurred during a workshop co-chaired by Fritz Cernica. All papers submitted under the title Soft X-ray Projection were returned to their authors with a singular request, rename it to EUV Lithography. This bold move solidified the new terminology's place in the industry. This series of events culminated in a landmark moment, the very first meeting dedicated to EUVL. Held at the scenic Mount Fuji in Japan, this gathering symbolized the industry's unanimous embrace of the new name and marked the beginning of a new chapter in the annals of lithography. But let's pause for a moment and think about it. Imagine using the term blue for the color on a shirt but calling it sky when it's on pants. That's how the naming felt. The soft X-ray wavelength was termed X-ray for one lithography but EUV for another. This shift left many semiconductor field engineers scratching their heads. At first, EUV appeared as just another UV variant but shorter in wavelength. Yet, the changes ran deeper. From excimer lasers shifting to tin plasma, from transparent optics to mirrors, and even the photomask's transformation from translucent to reflective, everything had evolved. What's so unique about this EUV? Was a common question among these engineers. But here's the revelation, Freeman had labeled what was essentially an X-ray as UV. 
For semiconductor field engineers, understanding the intricate nuances of technology is vital. If they had known from the start that a UV was actually an X-ray and not UV, they would have recognized its challenges much more quickly. From 1981 to 1996, the early days of UV lithography, the field underwent significant changes, setting the stage for the advanced technology we see today. Here's a breakdown of the four major milestones during this period. 1. Soft X-ray imaging. In 1981, J. Underwood and T. Barbie Jr. made a breakthrough. They constructed a layered synthetic microstructure, LSM, that could reflect soft X-rays. This LSM, made of 76 layer pairs of tungsten and carbon, was used to capture images of a five-line pattern on a silicon wafer. While this wasn't projection lithography, it was a foundational step. It demonstrated the potential of using mirrors in the soft X-ray spectrum, paving the way for Kinoshita's research and the first EUV projection. This was one of the early demonstrations of the basic concepts needed for EUVL. 2. Molybdenum silicon multilayer coatings. By 1985, the game was changing. T. Barbie Jr., S. Mroka, and M. Hetrick introduced molybdenum silicon multilayer coatings. These coatings weren't just an improvement, they were revolutionary. They achieved a high normal incidence reflectivity at wavelengths around 20 nanometers, surpassing theoretical expectations. This enhancement in reflectivity meant that EUV mirrors could now be more efficient, a development still influential in today's advanced ASML HVM tools. Reflective multilayer coatings initially provided only marginally larger reflectance than a grazing incidence mirror, but later could provide normal incidence reflectance close to the theoretical maximum, marking a significant advancement in the field. 3. Advancements in mirror precision, EUVL optics require almost flawless surfaces, with a roughness of just 0.1 nanometers or even less. Why? Because even tiny imperfections can cause scattering losses. Tinsley Laboratories led the way here. Initially, aspheric surfaces were seen as laboratory curiosities, but with advancements, they could be fabricated with a controlled spectrum of surface heights. Using computer-guided techniques, Tinsley Laboratories crafted aspherical mirrors with a precision of 1.5 nanometers by 1993. A study between 1991 and 1994, led by AT and T Bell Labs, pushed the boundaries further. One participant achieved a near-perfect 0.6 nanometer precision. By 2000, this was refined even more to an impressive 0.3 nanometers. 4. Elevating mirror precision with advanced measurement, we can't improve mirror roughness if we can't measure it precisely. To address this challenge, Gary E. Summergren of LLNL introduced the Phase Shifting Point Diffraction Interferometer, PSBDI, in 1996. This tool worked by capturing the interference pattern created when light from an optical fiber reflected off a mirror and interacted with the original light. This interference pattern was a telltale sign of even the minutest imperfections on the mirror's surface. With PSBDI, scientists achieved near-unprecedented measurement accuracy, ensuring the mirrors used in EUV lithography were top-tier. These milestones didn't just shape the future of EUV lithography, they also influenced a myriad of scientific and technological sectors, from astronomy to satellite communications. The work done on multilayer coatings for EUVL has also spurred important research on atomic layer formation and material interface quality. While some EUV-specific challenges persist, the focus has shifted from technical hurdles to cost and reliability considerations. In the first decade of the 30-year journey of EUV development, two significant milestones stood out. First was the introduction of a compact yet highly advanced EUVL laboratory tool, and second was the successful demonstration of an MOS device using this tool. In 1995, D.A. Tishner and his team at SNL developed the first EUVL laboratory tool known as the 10x2 Schwarzschild. This tool combined near-diffraction limited imaging with a 0.1 micrometers resolution, accurate stages, and an integrated alignment system. The EUV light was sourced from a debris-mitigated laser plasma, which was achieved by focusing a neodymium doped yttrium aluminum garnet laser focused on either solid xenon pellets or a high-density gas jet. This setup allowed for about 1,000 exposures without the need for condenser maintenance. 
The tool's optical components included a collector, a grazing incidence system for focus, and a 0.08 N Schwarzschild projection mirror coated with molybdenum silicon multilayer. For wafer processing, it featured a magnetically levitated wafer stage, an electrostatic wafer chuck, and both coarse and fine mass to wafer alignment systems. Building on the capabilities of this tool, in 1996, a joint effort between SNL, AT&T, and the University of California at Berkeley led to the creation of the first MOS device using a UVL with a notable 0.1 micron gate length, highlighting the potential of EUVL in semiconductor manufacturing. In the early stages of EUV development, two initial phases laid the groundwork. The first phase saw pioneering efforts, while the second phase focused on early R&D. By the conclusion of these phases, the technology had been successfully showcased with a compact lab microstepper, marking the inaugural operation of an MOS device using EUVL, as highlighted in the preceding slide. During these initial years, key concepts for EUVL were established, and critical challenges specific to EUV were identified. As the 1990s came to a close, the third phase kicked off. This was driven by the realization of EUV lithography's potential to achieve increasingly finer details. Recognizing its promise, semiconductor manufacturers worldwide, from the US to Japan and Europe, collaborated in industry consortia to advance EUVL technology, as depicted in the provided figure. In the midst of the 1990s, the US was witnessing significant advancements in the semiconductor industry. Leading companies, such as Intel, AMD, Ultratech, Tropel, and JMAR, were keen on exploring the potential of 13 nanometer extreme ultraviolet, EUV, light for lithography. To achieve this, they collaborated with the U.S. Department of Energy's national laboratories through what's known as CRATAS, or Cooperative Research and Development Agreements. However, during this period of industrial growth, the Department of Energy, DOE, was grappling with budgetary challenges. The U.S. Congress was cutting back on funding, particularly targeting programs they viewed as non-essential. This meant that research and development projects at the national laboratories, especially those not directly related to defense or weapons, were at risk. The impact was felt deeply, with the national labs even undergoing voluntary workforce reductions. By 1996, the DOE made a difficult decision. They chose to discontinue all efforts related to the EUV program. This cessation included projects that had been jointly funded with industrial companies through the mid-1990s Kratos. Yet, Intel saw the potential in the early EUV lithography demonstrations, both from the DOE labs and similar initiatives in Japan. They believed that EUVL held promise for the future of semiconductor manufacturing. With the DOE's exit and the looming possibility of the research team being dispersed to other projects, Intel recognized the urgency of the situation. To ensure the continuity of the EUV research and to retain the expertise of the team, Intel stepped in. In late 1996, they provided essential bridge funding. This interim support was crucial while they structured a broader program and established new craters with three pivotal national laboratories, LLNL, LBNL, and SNL. However, the research and development required to bring EUVL to fruition was anticipated to be quite costly, far beyond what any single lithography equipment manufacturer could shoulder on their own. Intel, in collaboration with national laboratories, estimated that an annual funding of around $60 million would be essential to sustain and expedite the R&D efforts across three major national labs. Recognizing the hefty financial requirements of EUVL research, Intel introduced an innovative approach. Instead of creating a new standalone entity, they suggested a virtual company model that would capitalize on the existing resources of national labs. This idea culminated in the formation of EUV LLC in 1997. This consortium brought together major players in the IC industry, including powerhouses like AMD, IBM, Infineon, Micron, and Motorola, though IBM was more inclined towards electron beam lithography. Their united goal was set to fast-track the development of EUV technology. They aimed to pool their resources, share technological advancements, and set a bold target. By 1999, they aspired to develop and operate a prototype 100 nanometers EUVL exposure tool, positioning themselves at the forefront of EUVL production tools. The operational structure of EUV LLC was built on four foundational pillars, EUV LLC itself, VNL as a dedicated research entity, semiconductor equipment manufacturers, and suppliers. Intel sent technical staff to work closely with the VNL teams, fostering collaboration. VNL, 
funded by the consortium, was the hub of R&D activities, while EUV LLC provided overall direction. In return for their financial contributions, intellectual property, IP, encompassing knowledge, patents, and trade secrets, was generated by VNL. This IP treasure trove was then shared with equipment manufacturers and suppliers, giving them a head start in accessing cutting-edge lithography tools. These manufacturers, in turn, had the liberty to sell these tools to non-members, but with a catch, they would channel the royalties back to EUV LLC. To finance this ambitious endeavor, EUV LLC offered shares to its member companies, priced at US $5 million each. Owning these shares came with a perk, priority access to the latest lithography tools. If a member chose not to exercise this privilege, the opportunity would be passed on to the next member in line. The year 1997 saw SVG lithography, which would later be acquired by ASML in 2002, joining the program. By the following year, both ASML and USAL had also entered into similar agreements with EUV LLC. The Engineering Test Stand, ETS, is a significant milestone of the EUV LLC program in the USA. Developed in collaboration with six semiconductor manufacturers, three national labs and various industry partners, the ETS showcased the potential of EUV technology for industrial applications in 2001. The ETS achieved a landmark by demonstrating the first full field scanning on a 200mm wafer. This early prototype, despite its compact size, set the initial industry standards by achieving a 100 nanometer CD for dense patterns and 70 nanometers for isolated features. The ETS incorporated hardware that closely aligned with semiconductor standards, including light sources, mirrors, masks, and resists. The ETS was equipped with a high-power laser-produced plasma, LPP, source, with the EUV radiation generated by a YAG laser beam focused onto a xenon cluster target. Its optical design met the requirements for printing both dense and isolated patterns. The four-mirror, Ring field projection system of the ETS projected an image of the reflecting reticle onto the wafer within a print field of 1.5 mm by 24 mm. Both the reticle and wafer were managed using magnetically levitated stages, ensuring precision and stability. As a prototype, the ETS naturally exhibits performance that doesn't match that of current high volume manufacturing equipment. However, its foundational design is closely aligned with the principles applied in HVM setups, emphasizing its significance in the evolution of EUV technology. In October 1998, Japan launched the OSET program, a three-year, $60 million initiative fully funded by the government. OSET brought together top microelectronics companies like Fujitsu, Hitachi, NEC, Matsushita, Mitsubishi, Oki, Sharp, Nikon, Samsung, Sony, SPC, Toshiba, and even Intel Corporation. Its goal was to accelerate Japan's progress in extreme ultraviolet lithography, EUVL, and catch up with international efforts. The OSET program covered various aspects of EUVL technology. The system section focused on optics, light sources like LPP, DPP, and synchrotron, and exposure systems. Two other sections tackled issues related to masks and resist processes and fabrication. After OSET, Japan launched several EUV development initiatives. 1. Light source development from 2001 to 2019. In 2003, Osaka University initiated the leading project with support from MEXT. This project partnered with UVA and aimed to research EUV light source plasma. At the same time, Gigafoden began developing the CO2 tin LPP EUV source, achieving an impressive output of 330 watt by 2019. 2. Exposure Tool Development in Early 2000s Celeta became a hub for EUV lithography research in Japan. Nikon introduced the EUV-1 tool, and Canon unveiled the SFET during this period. 3. Photo Resist Development in Early 2000s Celeta collaborated with global tech giants to advance EUVL research, with a strong emphasis on resist technologies. They worked on developing and evaluating photo resist technologies. 4. Mask development in early 2000s. Celeta placed a significant focus on mask development from the beginning, collaborating with international partners to improve mask fabrication and technology. While the efforts in light sources and exposure tools didn't lead to mask production, initiatives in photo masks and photo resist materials have persisted and remain significant in Japan's EUV landscape today. Nikon and Canon, two tech giants from Japan, ventured deep into the realm of EUV exposure tool development. Nikon's EUV-1 tool marked an advancement in the field. It utilized full-field projection optics, 
achieving a precise focus with its six-mirror system of NA0.25. Nikon also highlighted the potential of reaching NA0.43. They effectively addressed carbon contamination using UV dry cleaning and resolved mirror oxidation with an improved capping technique. The tool was powered by a xenon-fueled DPP type E UV source, producing a solid 100 watt. In 2008, Nikon reported a successful electrical test for a 32 nanometers line pattern over the full field. Canon's journey in EUV tool development is highlighted by their SFET and HSFET tools. The Small Field Exposure Tool, or SFET, was introduced in 2007 as a part of the Mirai Celeta project. This tool was designed with a two-mirror Schwarzschild objective and was powered by a compact xenon DPP source. Its primary role was to pave the way for early EUV resist development, addressing challenges like mask shadowing and flare effects. The tool's xenon DPP EUV source operated at 500 Hz, producing 65 mW per square centimeter at the intermediate focus position. Later on, EIDEC adopted the SFET, focusing on 16 nanometers half pitch resist development. EIDEC's high NA small field exposure tool, known as HSFET, was equipped with a xenon DPP source and a rotating turret with multiple sigma apertures. It had a field size larger than 30 times 200 micrometers and variable NA mechanics, ranging from 0.3 to beyond 0.5 NA. By August 2015, the HSFET was successfully installed, tailored for 11 nanometers half pitch patterning. Despite these efforts, Japan faced significant challenges in EUV development. The technology, while advanced, demanded an optimal light source and precision engineered mirrors. Collaborative efforts, such as the partnership between Nikon, Canon, and Gigafoden, were met with intense competition from ASML, which had strong alliances with Simmer, Zeiss, and Tromph. The market was evolving, with the demand for EUV tools not rising as initially projected. Furthermore, industry leaders like Intel had shifting priorities, influencing the direction of EUV advancements. Given these challenges in the dynamic market, both Nikon and Canon opted to adjust their focus within EUV development. This strategic shift positioned ASML at the forefront of the industry, achieving a record turnover of 18.6 billion euros in 2021 and surpassing competitors Canon and Nikon, who lacked access to the crucial EUV LLC IP. In Europe, the FALM Institute, supported by the Dutch government, was instrumental in early EUVL research. By 1991, they had developed an advanced EUV imaging system and a novel method for EUV reflective layer coating. By the mid-90s, research in Europe had expanded to exploring laser-induced soft X-ray sources. This momentum culminated in the formation of the EXALT program in 1994, bringing together industry giants such as ASM Lithography, FALM Institute, and Carl Zeiss Incorporated. Their partnership aimed for advanced high-power sources, precision in optics, and flawless masks. In 1998, the European Research Initiative Euclides was launched, focusing on mirror substrates, high reflectivity coatings, and vacuum stages. Euclides was driven by ASML in collaboration with Carl Zeiss and Oxford Instruments. 1999 saw the commencement of France's Proof program, dedicated to amplifying national EUVL capabilities and prepping for the industrialization of EUV components. Both the Proof and Euclides initiatives merged into the expansive Media Plus program in 2001. Media Plus was a significant collaborative effort, supported by its partners, national governments, and encompassed 35 projects across the realm of microelectronics. It involved 2,600 scientists and engineers from 220 partners across 17 European countries. With a budget of 4 billion euros for its eight-year duration, a notable 25% was allocated to EUVL endeavors. One of the flagship projects under Media Plus was the Ecstatic Project, led by ASML. It aimed to develop a full-field EUV alpha tool for 300mm wafer exposures, reflecting the collective European ambition in the EUVL domain. The Ecstatic Consortium, which included global leaders like ASML and Carl Zeiss, with French companies Sagem and Xenox, as well as collaborations from the likes of Oxford Instruments, provided complementary expertise, resulted in the design of two full-field EUV R&D tools. By the culmination of Ecstatic's efforts, ASML was equipped to develop an advanced UV lithographic tool for exposure of 300 mm wafers. Two of these alpha demo tools, ADT, were delivered in 2006, setting Europe ahead in EUVL research. By 2000, ASML was convinced of EUV's potential and decided to focus solely on it, discontinuing their E-beam and ion beam projects. In 2006, the alpha demo tools, ADT, 
were developed by ASML as a significant advancement in EUV lithography. These full field exposure tools were installed at the Consortia Invent in Albany, New York, and IMEC in Leuven, Belgium. Their introduction marked a transition of EUV lithography from research to practical application, as evidenced by the fabrication of functional 45 nanometers S RAMs on an AMD test chip using EUV patterned interconnect layers. The ADTs were prototypes equipped with Zeiss optics, featuring a numerical aperture, NA, of 0.25. They were designed for 300 mm wafers and incorporated Zeiss optics with ASML scanner. The ADT employed a tin DPP light source, transitioning from the xenon LPP found in the ETS prototypes. Additionally, its projection optics featured a six-mirror design with an NA of 0.25, which was distinct from the four-mirror design used in the ETS. The ADT played a pivotal role in the R&D environment, allowing researchers to gain first-hand experience with EUV lithography processes. By 2008, IMEX ADT had initiated EUV imaging analysis, achieving the printing of features as small as a 22 nanometers S RAM cell. This tool was instrumental in understanding EUV patterning challenges, such as shadowing effects, and the implementation of optical proximity correction to address these issues. Following the success of the ADT, a series of NXC 3100 scanners were introduced and directly installed at chipmaker sites, further solidifying the transition of EUV lithography into practical applications. In 1998, International Semitech, ISMT, in the USA initiated its EUVL program. This program supported mask modeling and the development of optics for two 0.3 name micro field exposure tools, MET, among other things. Research laboratories, R&D consortia, semiconductor equipment manufacturers, and various infrastructure suppliers collaborated, positioning EUVL as a contender for semiconductor device manufacturing at the 32 nanometers half pitch node and beyond. The Semitech EUV program's contributions in masks, sources, optics, and resist were pivotal for the maturity of the EUVL infrastructure. Semitech's efforts in optics contamination connected the EUVL development community to expertise that was traditionally outside the realm of lithography. Through workshops on source, mask, optics contamination, and resist, Semitech showcased its industry leadership. This included Semitech's role in supporting the International EUV Initiative and its working groups, which coordinated efforts among leading EUVL development consortia. Around the same time as EUV LLC, Semitech funded numerous short term projects. A significant portion of these projects aimed at advancing mask technology for next generation lithography, NGL, candidates, with nearly half of the $50 million budget over five years being allocated to EUV masks. The momentum for EUV development was in full swing by 2003, especially after EUV LLC and VNL demonstrated the technology's capabilities. Semitech embarked on a program to tackle the remaining challenges of EUV infrastructure, aiming to integrate EUV lithography into manufacturing. As a part of this initiative, Semitech set up the Mask Blank Development Center, MBDC, and Resist Test Center, RTC, in Albany, New York. Consortia in Japan and Europe were also making strides in preparing the infrastructure for manufacturing. By 2006 to 2007, suppliers worldwide had made significant progress, establishing EUV Alpha tool sites at locations like CNSE, Semitech in Albany, New York, IMEC in Leuven, Belgium, and Celida in Tsukuba, Japan. Insights from these alpha tool operations accelerated the development of resist and mask materials, leading to the readiness of beta tools by 2010 or 2011. Semitech concluded its EUV program at the end of 2015, but its contributions, especially in materials development, were pivotal for the industry. EUV technology, despite its promising potential and the successful demonstration of prototype and alpha tools, faced significant challenges in its journey towards commercialization and establishing a robust infrastructure. The annual International EUVL Symposium, which began in 2002 in Dallas, Texas, became a pivotal platform for industry professionals and researchers to assess EUVL's progress and pinpoint its challenges. Starting in 2003, the Symposium Steering Committee consistently identified the most pressing issues in EUV. From 2003 to 2015, the primary concerns revolved around the mask, EUV source, and resist. By 2008, significant strides had been made in EUV resist, attributed to enhancements in imaging resolution. However, as the deployment of EUV was deferred, the emphasis returned to challenges related to resist and source. 
This shift was influenced by progress in reducing mask defects and the potential introduction of a pellicle solution. The specifications for EUV resists also tightened, necessitating superior resolution, finer line widths, and quicker resists to cater to production demands. In recent years, the spotlight has predominantly been on refining the EUV source. Zooming into the specific challenges. 1. Source. The primary concerns revolved around the source's power and lifespan, especially the longevity of the condenser and collector optics. The industry sought a reliable high power source and collector module capable of consistently operating at 250 watts, ensuring over 85% uptime for processing 1,500 wafers per day. 2. Photo mask. The challenge lay in creating a consistently defect-free mask. Additionally, there was a pressing need for enhanced inspection and review mechanisms. 3. Photo resist. The goal was to simultaneously achieve superior resolution, maintain line edge roughness, LER, and ensure sensitivity. In summary, as EUV technology stands on the brink of revolutionizing lithography, it's faced with a final set of challenges that require collaborative and innovative solutions to fully unlock its potential. These challenges will be explored further in subsequent episodes of the EUV lithography series. EUV lithography's evolution is a compelling tale of international synergy. This game-changing technology, poised to reshape the semiconductor world, emerged not from an isolated idea but from the collective endeavors of several industry titans, each contributing their specialized expertise. Delving into blank mask infrastructure and inspection, the MOSI blank mask, foundational to the process, was constructed on low thermal expansion glass, complemented by chromium nitride on the reverse side to facilitate electrostatic chucking. Vico and applied materials were at the forefront, innovating ion beam deposition tools from OC multi-layer mirrors. When it came to defect inspection tailored for the EUV wavelength, KLA Tencor and Lasertech took the lead. And ensuring the final blank mask met the highest standards of quality and precision were industry leaders AGC, Hoya, and Shin, Etsu. Navigating mask fabrication process and inspection tools, applied materials was pivotal in devising process tools tailor-made for EUV mask patterning, guaranteeing a flawless integration into current manufacturing processes. In the realm of EUV mask patterning, IMS distinguished itself with its cutting-edge multi-electron beam writer equipment. And, naturally, the vital task of inspection and defect review in EUV mask patterning was adeptly managed by industry experts Lasertech, KLA Tankor, and a few other notable names. Discussing mask handling challenges, the pellicle remains a hurdle in EUV's high-volume manufacturing journey. TSMC has innovated its solutions, and ASML has recently unveiled pellicles crafted from carbon nanotubes. Yet, the cost factor remains a significant concern. Venturing into resist materials development, the formulation of EUV resists, indispensable for the lithography process, was a joint venture spearheaded by industry pioneers JSR, TOK, and Inpria. Their collaborative strides ensured that the materials integral to EUV lithography met the exacting standards the technology demanded. In conclusion, the odyssey of EUV lithography, from its conceptual stages to its commercial debut, is a shining beacon of what's possible when the global tech community collaborates. Each participant, armed with their niche expertise, tackled and overcame the multifaceted challenges EUV lithography presented, heralding its successful debut in the semiconductor domain. The progression from the Alpha Demo Tool, ADT, to the NXE 3400B HVM Tool represents a monumental advancement in ASML's EUV lithography journey. The ADT laid the groundwork, leading to the development of the NXE 3100 scanners, which were directly integrated into key chipmaker facilities. These scanners featured the advanced Starla 3100 optics of Zeiss, an enhanced version of the ADT optics. As the technology matured, the NXE 3300B, NXE 3350B, and the NXE 3400B emerged, each heralding its own set of optical advancements. However, this journey was fraught with challenges. While the 3400B, designed for high-volume manufacturing, HVM, was introduced in 2013, Samsung only fully capitalized on its capabilities in 2019. The challenges encountered during this period were multifaceted. 1. Numerical Aperture, NA, the ADT began with an NA of 0.25. As the technology evolved, there was a concerted effort to elevate this figure, with the NXE, 3300B and NXE, 
3400 be achieving an NA of 0.33. This enhancement brought its own set of optical complexities. 2. Off-axis illumination, to enhance resolution, a new illumination system was developed, incorporating the field facet mirror, FFM, and pupil facet mirror, PFM, diverging from traditional methods like the flex ray used in ARF. 3. Light source power, achieving a consistent and robust EUV light source remained a top-tier challenge for scanners. 4. Tin contamination, residues from the tin droplets used in EUV light sources posed a genuine threat, causing damage to the tool's collector, mirrors, photo masks, and even to the wafer. 5. Stochastic effects, as chip features shrank, random variations in printed patterns became increasingly significant, demanding innovative countermeasures. 6. Reticle defects, defects on EUV blank masks, especially on multi-layered mirrors, were a major concern. The introduction of multi-layer defect avoidance, MDA, technology provided some relief to this pressing issue. In 2019, Samsung Electronics achieved a significant milestone by adopting EUV lithography for their 7 nanometers LPP process. This transition, from the traditional ARF immersion requiring four exposures to a single EUV exposure, was groundbreaking. This innovation was prominently featured in the Bill Metal Layer process of their AP chip, which powered the Galaxy Note 10. Let's close our journey in the history of EUV by discussing the NXC 3400B from ASML, the first tool designed specifically for high-volume manufacturing, HVM. This isn't just another model in the vast landscape of EUV lithography, it represents a significant milestone, marking its debut in EUV HVM. And while it proudly bears the ASML name, it's the culmination of collaborative efforts from several industry titans. At its heart, the laser-produced plasma, LPP, type light source, a foundational element of its functionality, is a contribution from Simmer. Complementing this, the high-power drive laser from Trumpf plays an indispensable role. This laser is meticulously designed to convert tin droplets into a plasma state using infrared heat, a process crucial for the EUV mechanism. In the optics department, where precision is paramount, Zeiss stands tall. They've equipped the NXC, 3400B with both the illumination and projection optics, ensuring unparalleled accuracy and efficiency in the tool's operations. But with such diverse and intricate components, who ensures they harmonize perfectly? That's where ASML's expertise comes into play. They've masterfully integrated the contributions from each partner, orchestrating a cohesive, high-performing system. As we continue, We'll delve deeper into the intricate workings of this groundbreaking HVM tool in the coming episode, all based on information available to the public. Hey everyone! How did you find our deep dive into the evolution of EUV lithography, spanning from its inception in 1985 to its monumental achievement in high-volume manufacturing by 2019? While today's discussion wasn't overly technical, I wanted to emphasize the immense value and significance of EUV technology. This isn't just another advancement, it's the culmination of 34 years of relentless effort, global collaboration, dedication from brilliant minds, substantial financial backing, and unwavering belief in the potential of this technology. To me, it's reminiscent of monumental endeavors like the Apollo 11 moon landing. In our upcoming videos, we'll be introducing ASML's high-volume manufacturing tool, a testament to the dedication poured into EUV. A huge thanks for joining us on this journey through the intricate world of EUV lithography. We're just scratching the surface, and there's so much more to explore. If you found our conversation enlightening, we'd appreciate a thumbs up, a subscribe, or even a notification bell click. Yip yip. Arf arf. Your engagement and curiosity drive us forward. Stay connected with Semi Slides, we have a plethora of exciting content lined up for you eagerly awaiting our next discussion. Until then, keep innovating and stay fantastic.